It has been a very busy summer at Stamford Bridge this year. Last week, the Blues confirmed the arrival of German boy wonder Kai Havertz for a potential £71 million, taking their overall summer spending to over £200 million, subject to add-ons. Havertz joins the likes of Hakim Ziyech, Ben Chilwell and Timo Werner through the door in West London, as Roman Abramovich seems to have handed Frank Lampard his checkbook, and no team in world football has spent more on recruitment this summer, at least at the time of this recording. So a lot of people are casting either envious or simply intrigued eyes towards Stamford Bridge and asking the question, how, in this current financial climate, when so many teams appear to be struggling, can Chelsea afford to do all of this business? Following my video on the current situation at Liverpool last week, which did far better than I anticipated in terms of both views and feedback, as well as prompting a lot of discussion on social media, I thought I'd take a quick deep dive into the financial situation at Chelsea, as well as talking a little bit about the individual signings they have made and how I think they are shaping up ahead of next season and beyond. Essentially, this video is going to be all about... Dear God, I'm sorry Chelsea fans, I love you all, but that's got to be one of the worst chants in English football. It's like some kind of monotonous call for death. And before any of you say anything, mauled by the Tigers is ironic, it is a brilliant chant, and more fool you if you don't get it. Anyhow, back on topic, I think Chelsea have made some fascinating signings this summer, but I'm not sure anyone wants to watch an entire video just of me talking about the Blues transfer business, so I'll just incorporate it into this video towards the end. From a financial perspective, when asking how Chelsea can afford the significant investments that they have made on players and most likely wages in recent months, there are two points to consider. The first is, quite literally, how can they afford it, where is the money coming from, and the second, perhaps more pertinently, is how can they afford it whilst complying with UEFA's FFP rules. The answer to the first question is pretty straightforward, and his name is Roman Abramovich. In the case of Liverpool, as those of you who watched that video will recall, the fact that they only, in inverted commas, recorded around £40 million of profit for the period of May 2018 to May 2019, despite all of their success, gives some indication as to why they perhaps haven't been quite as extravagant in the transfer market as some might have hoped and or expected. The big difference between Chelsea and Liverpool on that front is that John Henry bought Liverpool in light of the introduction of FFP legislation and on the grounds that he could make the club a self-sufficient entity which didn't rely on him beyond his initial investment. Roman Abramovich bought Chelsea long before FFP was introduced in 2003 with no such intentions. The fact that Roman has invested more than £1.3 billion in Chelsea, £1.17 billion of which the club still owes him in the form of an interest-free loan, rather exposes the different approaches in terms of club finances between Henry and Abramovich, should evidence be required at all. It's also worth noting that Abramovich has more than six times Henry's estimated net worth, with a reported £12.7 billion fortune, meaning he has always had much deeper pockets to dip into than the American, regardless of approach. So in terms of where did Chelsea get their cash from, the answer, as it has been for the last 17 years, is their double denim donning Russian oligarch. One very quick tangent and point to make is that a couple of years ago, it looked as though Roman's love affair with the West Londoners may have been coming to an end. He no longer seemed intent on spending the same amount of money as the two Manchester clubs every transfer window, and when he was refused British citizenship and relocated from London to Israel in 2018, there were reports that he was actively looking for a buyer, having slapped a £2.5 to £3 billion asking price on the club, depending upon which reports you choose to believe. Abramovich may now be a long-distance admirer and supporter, at least in terms of his fixed home, but his love of Chelsea appears to be undiminished. His investment, once again, has been vast, and rumours of a sale have all but disappeared. Okay, now to the second point, which concerns FFP, and here's where things get a little bit more confusing, so stay with me. Whilst last week with Liverpool, I just delved into the club accounts to explain their incomings and outgoings, since that is all that is relevant to a club that doesn't wish to spend more than they have coming in, as we've already established, that isn't the case with Chelsea. An FFP isn't based solely on a club's published financial accounts. UEFA wanted to curb reckless spending and prevent clubs from accruing outrageous debts with the introduction of FFP but they didn't want to prevent teams from looking to better themselves, and they particularly didn't want to discourage investment in other areas, such as youth development, community spending, and improving or rebuilding facilities like training grounds and stadiums. 
As such, all these expenses, which show up in a club's annual published accounts, since they are obviously costs, are not counted towards their FFP allocation. So I will very quickly tell you a little bit about what is in Chelsea's accounts, but all the while, you should remember that the bottom line from the company accounts is not the bottom line the UEFA are interested in. In the most recent set of financial statements, covering the period from June 2018 to June 2019, Chelsea made some pretty hefty losses. £96.6 .6 million after taxes to be specific, and £101.8 million before taxation. Despite posting record turnover of £446.7 million, the Blues posted losses of £100 million thanks primarily to investment in signing new players and due to the costs related to relieving Antonio Conte and his staff of their duties. Chelsea paid a total of £188 million for Kepa Ariza Balaga, Jorginho, Christian Pulisic and a six-month loan deal for Gonzalo Higuain during this period, whilst the costs related to Conte and his backroom staff's dismissals totaled some £26.6 million. The club also received £60 million in player sales, most notably Thibaut Courtois, which is low by Chelsea standards. Their wage budget of £285 million is the fourth highest in the Premier League and the seventh highest in Europe, and it means that 64% of Chelsea's turnover is immediately redistributed into players' wages, which is a higher percentage than the likes of Manchester City, Liverpool and Manchester United. It's important to note that last year's accounts were abnormal by Chelsea standards, and that in the two previous years, they had actually recorded significant profits, including a pretext profit of £67.5 million in the 2018 accounts. As mentioned, that drop-off is thanks largely to the fact that Chelsea were competing in the Europa League rather than the Champions League, which is far less lucrative despite the fact that they won it, as well as their considerable transfer spending, chunky wage budget, and the costly sacking of Antonio Conte. Chelsea will post record revenue in their 2020 accounts, despite the problems caused this season from January onwards, thanks to a return to Champions League football and the lucrative sale of Eden Hazard. Meanwhile, Chelsea only signed Mateo Kovacic last summer due to their UEFA-imposed transfer ban. That's all fascinating stuff, but as mentioned, it is not the basis upon which FFP is calculated. FFP restricts teams to losses of no more than €30 million Euros across a three-year period, only accounting for incomings and outgoings the UEFA considers relevant for FFP purposes. By this measure, given how much Chelsea are believed to have spent this summer, they would fail FFP miserably for the three-year period of 2018, 19 and 20. However, and it is a big however, there are two things worth bearing in mind. One is that Chelsea's transfer business this summer is unlikely to be done, and by that I mean primarily in terms of outgoings. Most seasons, Chelsea bring in a fortune in player sales, more than any other team in the Premier League in fact, but so far this season, there has only really been the pre-arranged sales of Alvaro Morata and Mario Pasalic. Given Chelsea's incomings, one would expect to see some departures before the window belatedly slams shut this season with the likes of Timwi Bakayoko, Michi Batshuayi, Danny Drinkwater, and one of Marcus Alonso or Emerson, surely likely to be on the move, bring in some sizeable funds themselves. Okay, maybe not sizeable in the case of Drinkwater, but you get the idea. The other point, and the key aspect of all this, is that FFP has been significantly altered by UEFA ahead of the next couple of seasons due to the pandemic and the impact that it had upon teams last season, and that it will continue to have at least in the early parts of next season, if not beyond. Keen to avoid a situation in which a large number of teams fail to meet FFP requirements and understanding of the revenue hit many teams have suffered, UEFA will only assess FFP on a two-year basis in 2021 rather than a three-year basis, looking at only 2018 and 2019, thus disregarding 2020's financial results due to the pandemic. In theory then, teams could pass FFP in 2021 with unlimited losses in 2020, although that would be pretty short-sighted, since once 2022 rolls around, UEFA will take four years of financial data, 2018, 2019, 2020 and 2021, halving any losses recorded in 2020 and 2021, and writing off any losses thought to be related to the pandemic, such as matchday revenue, whilst fans weren't allowed to attend games. It is a very lenient system, and one which gives owners who have perhaps been hamstrung by turnover figures the license to go out and write a few checks, which is exactly what we have seen from Roman Abramovich. In essence, unless Chelsea were to go absolutely wild in future transfer windows, or have offered their new signings utterly absurd contracts, they should be fine when it comes to FFP. As for the players Chelsea have signed themselves, I think it's going to be fascinating to see how they get on next season. 
Hakim Ziyech is a player I've liked ever since his breakout campaign at Heeren Bain, and he has just got better and better every season, becoming the most creative player in the Netherlands virtually every season. I'm surprised it's taken this long, he is now age 27, for a team from one of Europe's top five leagues to poach Ziyech, and in the current market, I think £33 million is exceptionally reasonable. The question mark, of course, is how will Ziyech take to the change in pace going from the Eredivisie to the Premier League, and it is obviously a big unknown at this stage. We have seen so many brilliant Eredivisie imports to English football, but just as many flops, and Ziyech isn't necessarily the most physical. He has a fantastic work rate though, he's brilliant on the ball, and I can think of few players better equipped to provide service to Timo Werner. It's a similar story with Werner indeed, who you'd have to say appears to be great value at £47.5 million off the back of a season in which he scored 34 goals for RB Leipzig. Werner is totally different to any of the centre forwards at Chelsea right now, and although there are many variables, I think he looks tailor-made for the Premier League. Werner isn't the type to go on a mazy run or put an inch-perfect ball into the box, but he has remarkable acceleration, he doesn't give defenders a moment's rest, and he is lethal in front of goal. Again, he may need a little bit of time to find his feet, but I think Chelsea would have to really balls things up to prevent Timo Werner from scoring a hatful of goals, and I can't wait to see him in action. Funnily enough, Timo Werner was the youngest player to reach the landmarks of both 50 and 100 Bundesliga appearances until he lost both records to Kai Havertz. I've seen a lot of people suggesting Chelsea have overpaid for Havertz, but I can't agree. I think this boy is special, and right up there as one of the best young footballers on the planet right now. Still aged only 21, Havertz played predominantly as a number 10 at Leverkusen last season, and even practically up front at times, but he can play virtually anywhere. Given Chelsea's strengths, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see Havertz a little deeper next season, while still looking to break ranks, run in behind the back line, and score goals. A little bit reminiscent of a young Michael Ballack, Havertz has a bit of everything. He's a grafter, he's brilliant on the ball, and he knows how to score goals. These are famous last words, of course, but I can't see him being anything other than a phenomenal success in the Premier League, unless he suffers a dreadful long-term injury of some sort. I could go on forever, and the Blues have also brought in Ben Chilwell and Thiago Silva, of course, who should strengthen their backline, and whilst Chilwell didn't come cheap, Chelsea do at least now have a left-back who can defend. Ultimately, I think Frank Lampard has signed some tremendous individuals, it's just a question of how they gel as a team, and how quickly they can hit the ground running. This season won't be like last season, when fairytale Frank could do no wrong, and Champions League qualification was seen as a triumph against all the odds. I always thought that was a tad disingenuous, but now there will be real expectations. Chelsea have spent big, and they have a superb squad, and one would think that a top 4 finish would now be Roman Abramovich's minimum expectations, with the Russian perhaps harbouring hopes of a challenge for the Premier League title. Chelsea's squad is a strong one, with depth all over the park, but question marks surely remain over their number 1. Kepa Ariza Balaga lost his place in the Blues starting 11 to Willy Caballero last season, a man who is so old, he actually fought for Argentina in the Paraguayan War of 1864-1870. A little bit like Liverpool before they signed Alisson, I don't believe Chelsea can win the Premier League title with either Kepa or Caballero in goal, and it's a little bit bizarre that Manchester United currently have three goalkeepers who are all better than any of the keepers that are at Stamford Bridge. What's more, what will Chelsea's transfer activity mean for the Blues' homegrown talent? Frank Lampard was widely lauded for handing opportunities to the likes of Rhys James, Mason Mount and Tammy Abraham last season, but how much game time will those players, along with Fakayo Tamore and Callum hudson Adoy, actually get now? Football is a results business, and as much as all football fans love to see a local ad flourish in the first team, if Chelsea are winning games, no one will complain that Billy Gilmore has only made four Premier League appearances by February. However, if results don't look so good, and youngsters that impressed last season are left to stagnate, things could quickly turn sour for Super Frank. For all those reasons, I think Chelsea are going to be fascinating to watch next season, and I think all round, we should have a vastly more entertaining Premier League this season than we have had in the last few years. That's all from me for today, I hope you enjoyed today's video, please do drop us a like if you found the video to be even remotely interesting or informative, or if you're just feeling kind. I should say that if you would like to find out more from a purely financial perspective, there is a superb thread on Twitter about the football finance guru Swiss Ramble, which goes into even more detail than I've done here, speculating as to the exact figures we could see in Chelsea's future accounts based upon the signings they have made, and their likely future wage budget. And he's also done a thread about Liverpool's finances since my Liverpool video came out, so if that's your kind of thing, I would highly recommend checking out his account. 
Thank you all for watching. Let me know what you think of Chelsea's transfer business and how you think they'll get on next season in the comments. And as ever, don't forget to subscribe to HITC7s and turn on notifications. Oh, and you can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram, where the username is simply at HITC7s on both platforms.